Welcome to the Staying Free podcast. This podcast seeks to give a voice to real people around the world who are attempting to stay free, stay sovereign, and stay sane in a world which is changing faster than ever. In this episode, I talked to Richard Nichols, an entrepreneur turned writer who left the UK many years ago, fearing that PC culture and a weakening of traditional values had set the country on a dangerous path. I talked to Richard about how this shift in culture had affected his own life, as well as the political landscape at large. I hope you enjoy this conversation, and if you have any feedback or suggestions for interesting guests, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. A link is in the show notes. On to the episode. Hi, Richard. Thanks so much for coming on. really appreciate you having a chat today. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. So Richard, you are a writer, and this is definitely something that I want to get onto, is your work. Um, But just to give a brief introduction um, of yourself, can you just tell us a little bit about your background? You're currently living in uh, Mexico, so uh, could you tell us kind of uh, where you're from and how you ended up in Mexico and just a bit about yourself? Sure. Um, Born in Jamaica to a British father and Mexican mother, strangely enough. I grew up in England, in Buckinghamshire. Uh, Leaving home, went to university for a while, didn't really dig it, so quit that and became a businessman. Ended up in London, an entrepreneur for about 10 years. Uh, During that time, I basically started to see and feel the things I didn't like about the way the country was going. This was pre-Blair still, but when Blair came in, it, it really... It uh, became apparent to me that the whole thing was going badly wrong, to put it mildly. And I started looking at what I was going to do about it. And there aren't that many options. I, I looked at the Tory party, uh, talked to them in the local constituency. I was repulsed by what I saw in, in the Tory party. And, uh, you know, I couldn't see myself ever going anywhere with them. And I didn't see any other options. Um, so I finally decided to write a, a novel that would try and explain the way I see things, or seeing things, and um, maybe help others come to terms with what was going on. It took me 10 years to write the novel. I went, I'd, I'd saved some money from being a businessman. Um, they pretty much ran out by the end of the 10 years. Uh, I got a publisher in London. I got an agent, top, top publisher, top agent. But then at the last minute... Um, the deal fell through because of the politically incorrect content and the whole 10 years sort of went into the dustbin for for the time being. Instead, I, you know, had to reassess my position in life, uh, mid, mid-life almost. So I got married, we were getting, I got married at that point anyway. Um, we were in London, my wife and I, we decided we were going to have children. So we started to review the position in London and I quickly concluded that it wasn't going to be good for a family and so on so on. So I looked at options and this is where my Mexican mother came back into the equation and I had connections with Mexico but had never really been convinced by it. There were good parts and I, I enjoyed holidays there. Never saw myself living there. But as luck would have it, we came to Merida in Yucatan for a holiday and I everything fell into place within a few days. Um, and so we decided to buy a property here, moved out of London, you know, took all the stuff, quit uh, jobs and stuff, and we re-established ourselves. And now we've been here 14 years nearly. It's a terrific place. I'm enjoying my life like I, like I would never be in England, I don't think. Certainly at the level of... Um, income I have. I could never enjoy the quality of life in the UK that we have here. And um, yeah, that's it really. Great. So um, I just want to touch on the entrepreneur um, aspect of what you were doing when you were back in the UK. What kind of um, business were you involved in? Right. I started off, I I jumped, I quit university. I I was going a bit mad there. I just found it very um, pointless really. Um, And I didn't know what on earth I was going to do, but I had a Mexican mother. Mexican food was still a, an unknown concept in the UK. This was about 1985. And we started about the first tortilla factory, believe it or not, in the UK. Um, and it became a good, big success. We supplied restaurants, supermarkets, Harrods and all that. And 
it was it was a business success, but I found it very frustrating. I, I, I was in a factory um, most of my time. Uh, I wanted more. Out. I was mid, young, young, early twenties. I wanted to get out and see see the world a bit more. Um, as it happened, Corona Extra Beer was looking for a vehicle or person to take the brand into Europe, and they found me um, because of the Mexican food, and I got the contract to take uh, the beer into the, uh, for the UK, Ireland, and several other countries. And that took me um, into the sort of next level of business. Um, it was a bit too good to be true. It was a huge success, fantastic time, had a riot, but uh, politics and, and Mexican in, uh, levels of, uh, <laughs> how can I put it, integrity, um, compromised the situation eventually. And I decided to, to bail out uh, at a good time, which was, turned out to be a, a good thing, I think, overall. And you said that you didn't like what you saw in the political world and you maybe had a little bit of a foray into that. Um, what was it you uh, were trying to do or what were the conversations you were having and what was it that you didn't like? Well, I wasn't really convinced that the Tory party were a solution, but if you're looking at trying to sort of change things, you've got to look at every alternative and the Tory party obviously stand out as the sort of sort of, and I put it in inverted commas, um, sensible, common sense, right of centre, practical vehicle to do that. Um, I was living in Bicester at the time, so I went to the Bicester Tory party. I went to a few drinks, I, I met the MP, and it was awful. It, uh, the people, totally unconvincing. They weren't even the kind of people you could share a drink with, let alone pour your heart out to or, or hope that we're going to save the country. The MP was a, an ardent, yeah, I think the most ardent of all the uh, pro-Europe MPs. There were whispers of corruption about his behaviour. I have no idea if they were true or not. It, it was a shit show, basically. And I, 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 was, I felt physically you know, repulsed. It wasn't that I made a logical decision that this wasn't the vehicle. I just knew that there was no, no future there for me. And I, and I think it's been proved right. Look at where we are with good old Boris there, um, who was supposed to be the libertarian, you know, get out of Europe option, and, and uh, look where we are today. Is that how you would describe your political views on the kind of libertarian side of things? Started out very ultra-libertarian. I used to be... Um, Used to, there was a libertarian bookshop in Floral Street in Covent Garden many years ago, and I used to be a regular there. It, this was when I was a teenager. I was buying every text I could. Um, and it served me quite well for a long time. I'm glad I, I went the libertarian route. But about mid-20s or so, um, I began to see the world was a little bit more nuanced, um, especially the questions of nationality and identity and stuff. And I've drifted from libertarianism slightly to, to a more um, nuanced position um, since then. And um, during the years I've been working already, and, and as a schoolboy even, I've started to notice things that weren't right with the way I saw the country. Um, maybe in those days they were harder to define than they are now, but I could see the um, embryonic stages of where we're at even 20, 30 years ago. And I thought, well, I've made a bit of money. I've got some, I don't want to go straight back into business. I'll try and write a book. I dedicate, uh, thought I'd dedicate a couple of years to it and see how I got on. And if it didn't work, I'd um, bail and go back to the business world. As it happens, it took 10 years. Um, I was pretty satisfied with the product. And I did get a publishing, top publisher in, in West End interested. They got me an agent. It was all going swimmingly until somebody in the editorial team picked up that the whole thing was very anti-woke and politically incorrect. This was about 20, 2005. And that sort of thing was just beginning to rear its head. It wasn't established, but you could tell it was um, a sort of rising tide of political correctness. So the whole project got binned overnight and left me a bit high and dry. Anyway, backup plan, um, get on with life. Uh, I got married to... Um, a woman who lived in London. We were in London for the first few years of our marriage, but we could see that 
if we wanted a family and so on, uh, London, our days in London were going to be limited. So we looked at alternatives. Mexico came up through my mother. And lo and behold, uh, that's where I ended up. That was 14 years ago. Okay, so you mentioned that you started to see things relatively early on, which I presume is quite similar to what a lot of people are experiencing now or are seeing right now in the world. But you were very, um, I guess, almost perhaps hyper aware to it, or perhaps um, it was just something which arrived at your industry before it's arrived at at most. So what was it that you were seeing at that time, which uh, made you start to question, um, I guess, the culture in the UK? There were personal incidents in starting a business. You come across, you, you run straight into a wall of health and safety and, and all sorts of things, which were, again, very embryonic in those days. But now you can see how dangerous health and safety is. I mean, health and safety has shut the world's economies down for the last two years, basically, um, under medical pretext. But I was my business was shut down overnight once because of some issue, stupid issue, um, and... and it, 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 you know, early on, I was aware that there was an awful lot of power in the hands of people who really... The woman who shut me down was my age. I was only 21. I'd just come out of college. Um, and she just, with a wave of her hand, she just shut the business. And we survived it and so on. But you begin to appreciate that things weren't... It wasn't meant to be that way. I was employing people. I was trying to get a you know, product that we could export for the country, you know, help the country and all sorts of things. And here's this bureaucrat. Um, it fostered in me strong libertarian tendencies, which were already there. And you didn't, didn't take much. It, once you started noticing, you could see that things were going uh, awry on the immigration front. There was issues with um, uh, taxes, uh, and, and ultimately, you get to the point where you say, well, what's the alternative? Where can we go? And of course, in the UK two-party system, you can't. You're trapped either way. And once that realisation came, uh, then I thought, well, we have to look at other ways to, to fight this. It's, it's not just going to be done through the vote and the ballot box. Um, and uh, the culture war is, is one that appealed to me, if you like. And so that's where I drifted towards yeah, on that health and safety note, I mean, this really reminds me, um, I, I don't know if you've, have you done a lot of traveling in your time? Fair amount, yeah. So I've done quite a bit of traveling and I notice that when I go to foreign countries, um, there is a massive disregard for health and safety, but people kind of just accept it. People just kind of accept that's the way it is. And if anything, people flock towards it. Um, and I always find it really interesting that I will go to, you know, places like uh, Vietnam or, or Thailand or, or India, and you will get people who travel there who in the UK, they would be all for saying, oh, you know, every business has to put their health and safety certificate. You know, let's say you're going out for food. It's like you've got to have your food uh, safety certificate on the back wall and I'm not going to go anywhere that's got less than five stars, etc. And these same people will travel to somewhere like India and they'll be eating things, uh, you know, that are being cooked on the side of the street. Um, yeah. And what what I always find interesting is just that people accept it when they go to these other countries that the culture there is kind of cultivated um, through an openness and through an, an, an accepting of risk by the general kind of population. Um, whereas we kind of fight against these things at home and people generally think that regulation is a good thing at home, but then, you know, flock to these other countries. And f in my experience, you realize the vibrancy of life in these other places. Um, That's right. And it's, and it's something that I feel like we've lost in the UK. I don't know if you uh, agree with that. Absolutely, 100%. Um, and, and it's even worse, actually. It trickles down into people's characters and they become like they are today, um, totally over-pampered pets. They're, they're closeted to the point where they can't go out without face masks, plastic masks, gloves, gel, you know... Uh, we have lost the ability to perceive risk completely, and a lot of it comes because we've been looked after so much. We're a bit like animals that have been in a zoo for all their life, and then they finally, the glorious moment arrives where they let them go, and they starve to death in about three weeks because they have no idea how to handle reality. Um, and it's a very sad situation. 
Um, on that, I think, and we'll maybe come on to this, the, the third world, because of its um, ability to continue without these overbearing restrictions, is, is a lot less fragile and less complex in our society. And it's a, more resilient as a consequence. I liken it to uh, an old beat-up Volkswagen versus a, the West is like a super-duper Ferrari. The Ferrari loses a couple of screws and you have to wait two weeks and pay hundreds of dollars and get an expert to put it back together again before it can go another yard. But an old Volkswagen breaks down, someone with some string and a hammer will get it going immediately anywhere in the world um, for very little cost. And of course, as we enter this new world where things are beginning to seize up, I'd rather have a Volkswagen that can get me to where I want to go, albeit without much comfort than a Ferrari that just sits in the garage and, and doesn't move. And I think that's kind of where we're at at the moment. The, the third world is becoming much more attractive on the grounds that at least some, it, they're like lifeboats, that at least you survive um, in some comfort rather than being on the big Titanic that's going under, albeit with orchestra and kitchens and everything else you want. <laughs> uh, yeah, I totally agree. And... Um... You know, another thing that I find very obvious, which seems to not really be part of the mainstream conversation, is that, you know, most of the countries that are really growing their economies and that are actually improving the quality of life for their citizens are places which it's not necessarily that they're deregulated, it's just that they were never regulated. You know, places like, again, going back to the example of Vietnam, I mean, I think that actually was... Um, might have been the number one growing economy, um, certainly. I mean, until until they've gone completely crazy with coronavirus and decided to seal their borders. But, um, you know, that, that aside, uh, certainly what I witnessed over there was that people are incredibly free. People can, uh, you know, this is supposedly a communist country, but it felt to me to be far more libertarian than most Western nations that I've visited. People are able to start businesses relatively friction-free. Um, people are incredibly thrifty. Um, people tend to kind of recycle and reuse things more, um, all, all these kind of, kind of things because they're able to do things and there's not um, these kind of entrenched uh, systems which are causing the individual to have to comply with uh, all these different various regulations. And it seems to kind of breed a culture which is so much more fluid and which ultimately leads to increased standards of living. Whereas in the West, we seem to be so obsessed with, well, we need to have a regulation for this, that and the other thing. Whereas, yes, there might be these specific examples where um, you could argue, well, somebody, let's say, for instance, going back to the example of food safety, if somebody um, decides that they want to go to a restaurant and they say, hey, this place has to have um, the food safety certification, which basically doesn't exist in most of the world. This is a complete Western phenomenon. Um, most people can just start a restaurant and they don't need to do a, food, a you know, pay all the money to get a food safety course. But what this actually does is it, it puts people out of the market. And then the only people who can afford those courses are people who have got chains and, you know, Starbucks and, you know, McDonald's, they're all going to yeah. be able to afford it. And what it does is just ends up meaning that, well, the individual can't be um, privy to that. They, they don't get a foot in the door and you have a kind of centralization of the whole economy, which then the exact same leftist people who are arguing for pro-regulation end up complaining about, well, money has been centralized into a few pockets. And the answer is, or one of obviously many answers is, well, yeah. if you de deregulate the economy, then you allow the individual to actually compete with some of these powers who actually love regulation because it, it, it shuts out competition. Yes, I totally agree. In the, what we're seeing, I think, is that the weaknesses of the third world, the traditional weaknesses, corruption, incompetence, um, anarchy to an extent, are becoming, in this context, modern world, bonuses, they're benefits to a society. Um, here, I haven't had to do it, but if a health inspector came in like it happened to me in the UK, I would probably um, offer them a 50 bucks tip and the, uh, you know, the big issue that was shutting down my business would probably go away for, for the foreseeable future. Um, in that they're incompetent, so they, they don't have this level of control. Um, the government's incompetent anyway, uh, the, the British government do. We have the worst of all worlds. We have bureaucrats that are actually intelligent and, uh, and sort of um, very good at what they want to do. Uh, it's not always the case in the rest of the world. So, yeah, these... 
these fault lines in, in the, in the um, third world are kind of guarantors that things can't really go much more in that direction. Cashless society in Mexico, forget it. Most people haven't got a bank account, can't read uh, well enough to, to open one. The, the, all sorts of issues. Would, uh, and they hate the, the politicians. You know, they, the politicians, they live in fear of their lives. <laughs> My local, my, we had a hurricane last month and for three days we had no electricity. And um, the villagers took the local mayor into the jungle with a rope and told him, here's the phone, sort it out or you're not leaving. And within, he was terrified, I saw his face. And within three hours we had power back in the village. That would never happen in the UK or anywhere you know, in the West. And, and it's more the pity. <laughs> exactly. And, um, you know, I've even heard theories about this. I don't know if you've read the book, The Sovereign Individual. It rings a bell, but I haven't. In this book, one of the things that's mentioned there is that um, during the kind of time when, you know, you've got the kind of digital economy, which is uh, allowing people to move around and be more fluid, etc., that the, the entrenched powers will try to shut that off. And one of the things it specifically says is that places that are more kind of uh, anarchic or, or have, you know, essentially things like cartels and um, these challenges to government power will become more attractive because actually when the politicians are trying to take up all the power, what you actually want is a system um, of opposition to that. And in many ways, um, I think that the that Mexico having cartels, although I'm not going to, you know, of course, um, advocate that people join cartels or that they're by any means a good thing, but it does seem to have, uh, to, to have some kind of restriction on what the government is able to do because you have a contest to that power in some way. Um, which obviously in many ways that's going to go against what the people want. And you know, that's not to say that cartels haven't you know, terrorized communities and do, done all of this bad things. However, it does seem to um, keep governments in check to some degree, at least in some areas. Yes. Um, I'm no fan of them either, but you're, you're absolutely right. They do tend to leave um, people who aren't involved in the drug trade alone. Obviously, there's um, collateral damage, if you want to call it that. But um, I think what we've all, uh, well, this brings into another aspect. The West, drug cartel, stop and think about it if you do for a minute. Pfizer, Moderna, which would you prefer? Uh, you know, a, a relatively minor bunch of sadists in, in, the, in, in very um, compartmentalized parts of your country going, killing each other, or, or people like Pfizer and Moderna and, and, and co that seem to have power beyond any kind of limit and have shut down the whole world basically um, and certainly destroyed, been much more destructive in a few years than the cartels have ever been. Um, yeah, so, so it's, it's, if given a choice, that's <laughs> sad to say. This section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship free platforms. On that note, I, I think I read a tweet uh, recently that just said the difference between a drug cartel and a pharmaceutical company is that one isn't forcing you to take their product. <laughs> <laughs> so true. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you are. So um, as you know, I have also been living in Mexico for the past uh, six months. And similarly to you, obviously came to that conclusion many years later that Mexico was a very good option to try and uh, retain some freedom in this world. Um, but I'd like to just talk to you a little bit about where you see Mexico going um, politically, because I've, I've had kind of mixed feelings about Mexico. For instance, before I went there, um, and even to this day, you don't require a test to enter Mexico, which is, I, I believe it might even be the only place in the world now. I think, I think Costa Rica now requires one. So I think Mexico, there might be some countries in Africa I'm un unaware of, but certainly you don't need a, a um, test to enter Mexico at this stage. Uh, you don't need a vaccine. Um, there are no vaccine passports or even really much discussion about vaccine passports within the country. However, uh, you know, knowing Mexican people, it does seem like they are being put under pressure to take the vaccine from a commercial standpoint in terms of uh, from their employers, etc. Is that also your experience? Yes. Um, it, I, I, I despair, but it, it seems to be a class thing. The upper classes are flocking. They're even flying out of the country to get injected elsewhere um, at their own expense. Um, it's seen as a kind of status symbol that you uh, can, can do that. But the overall take-up apparently is below 30% in the country. So that's very positive. Um, 
the, you can never guess the future in Mexican politics, obviously, uh, for clear reasons. But the president has come out again. This is very unusual, too. And the fact that he's still alive is even more unusual. But he's come out against Vax, Vax Sports, the big farmer. He's come out against GMOs and the Green Deal, which for a lefty is quite, he's an old fashioned lefty. And God bless him in a way, because although he has his faults on these very core issues, he's been solid as a rock. And we do worry that someone will slot him for the for that so for the foreseeable future he's got three more years um we're okay by the look of it my big hope i don't think mexico's immune but i as i've said to several people people are bombarding me at the moment with tweets uh, t- uh, on twitter to asking advice and stuff and asking me this question um with the worldwide covid vaccine rollout the best you can do is hope that is play for time two, three, four years might make all the difference. I think there'll be such a backlash and such a collapse of the narrative in the, in the West in the next 18 months that people in Mexico who haven't had it, will, they will never have to have it because it will all be over effectively before it started here. So Mexico gives you time. There are other countries you can go to to get time, um, remote ones in Africa or whatever. I'm sure you pretty safe, but the trouble is you're, you're paying a big price personally. Uh, you're going to be in a very um, remote part of the world, probably not much um, civilization as we like to think of it, hospitals and stuff. Whereas in Mexico, you get the best of both worlds. You've got all the good quality stuff at a price, but you get it quite cheap. Um, and yet you don't have to be part of this experiment that's happening elsewhere. So I'm, I'm bullish. I say yes. And on, and on other fronts, Mexico looks good. China's in trouble with the West, maybe collapsing itself, or with a lot of industries coming back. And it's going to go to a lot of it's going to come here. We're already seeing factories being built there front and center. Um, it's many other reasons I can go on about, but uh, I'm bullish on many fronts. Yes. And I've had the same experience as well. I've had a lot of people um, since I went to Mexico who have been reaching out to me asking what the situation's like and where to go, etc. So I, yeah, I've had the same experience there. So I want to get on a little bit to your writing. Um, so you decided to become a writer when you were kind of, um, when the entrepreneurial journey was coming to an end. Um, what kind of themes are you writing about and what inspired that? Um, one thing that inspired me is that I'd always been a James Bond fan, uh, like the novels in particular, the films, some of them are great, some aren't, but I noticed that that, uh, franchise, the film franchise was losing its way. It was becoming pretty, even back then you could tell, I, I'm con- convinced that that's happened now. I think they're completely lost their way. They've killed the bloody guy. And as people say, the one rule in first rule of cinema is you don't kill James Bond. <laughs> but um, I did feel that there was going to be an opportunity sooner or later to fill the, not fill the gap, you'll never fill those shoes, but um, provide an alternative, a bit like Jason Bourne did, but he's more cinematic. I wanted to do it from a literary perspective. So that was a kind of, that set the, the framework. And as a, as a result, I wrote a thriller rather than a love story or whatever. Um, but I also wanted it to be political. I wanted it to appeal to young males. I think there's a real problem with um, masculine identity at the moment. And a thriller is a better way of doing that than any other. Well, if you're going to write a book for boys, it might as well be a thriller. They don't read anything else. Um, so the two c- came together to, to, to drive me in that direction. And it's not an easy thing, writing a thriller that's got politics in it. I'll say that. But in the end, I think I created um, a product that combines both elements to a satisfactory level. And uh, that's great because that's what I set out to do originally, albeit on a much shorter time scale <laughs> I set out. Okay, so you mentioned about the um, masculine identity aspect, and that's uh, an interesting point that I'd really like to talk to you about. So what is it about the, um, I guess, the perception of the masculine identity uh, right now in, in culture, which you disagree with? And um, I guess, what is it that you're trying to do with your writing to kind of combat that? Well, I started out as a libertarian, um, to give it context. And my journey has taken me to what's now called 
reactionary. Uh, it's a word I never knew, but it, it basically means you look back at the old days and you think, oh, they did that quite well. How come, how come you could post a letter in London in 1890 or something and it would be delivered? You could send it at breakfast asking someone for lunch and they would, they would get it. It was like email almost. And yet today you put a letter, it costs you 90p to send a first class stamp in England now, I believe, or something, and it, you'd be lucky if it gets there within three days and so on. And I, I keep, wherever I look, I look at how they did it 100 years ago, and it seems to be that they, you know, with the obvious exceptions of some medicine and some technology and some other things, um, they, they ran society very well. So I'm, I'm just, I hark back to an older age. Um, I'm not totally passive. I'm not sort of lying there wishing that it would come and, and uh, expecting it to happen magically. I, I, uh, I'm a bit more um, belligerent than that, but that's my position. Um, so I look at men today, it, and, I don't, and I don't see the kind of men uh, that I see when I look at history books or photos of people 100 years ago, even in, the, in their physiognomy, the, the way they look, um, let alone the way they behave, the, the way they treat responsibility and fatherhood uh, and a lot of other things. It's, it, to me, it's a, it's a tragedy what's happened. Now, that might not matter. I mean, I think architecture is a tragedy. I think uh, modern architecture, I think all sorts of things are a tragedy. But the trouble with the man... Uh, if he if he's like that, and if he's not pulling his playing his role in society, then everything else crumbles. It's the keystone to me, the man, and obviously the woman in a different sense. But um, that's why I pay it special attention because I don't. I think without real strong individual men around, the, the game's over. You'll never you'll never win. Yeah, and um, do you think then that some of the societies which are kind of proliferating now they still seem to have some kind of a identity for men where men aren't kind of scorned by society and treated you know as if they are they should be kind of guilty for their masculinity etc yeah I, I think it's the natural state i think um it of the world is that men are strong and virile and, and looked up to um it's been literally squashed in the west um physically um mentally, yes, everything. It's been a deliberate policy for about, I reckon you can date it to about 100 years. Um, and obviously the, those places that don't uh, have the great benefits of Western media and Western psychologists and Western uh, entertainers and so on um, have avoided the worst of it. And some countries like China right now are actually taking active steps to shut down uh, those elements of Western uh, um, culture that that promote this kind of uh, nihilistic modern man, effeminate to a degree. Uh, they could, they have a they have a, an insult word for us. It's bai zhu, which is like girly boy or something in Chinese. I don't know the details. Um, and you know they, they ban films and they ban. Uh, they have special schools to remasculate boys that are failing. You know they're looking a bit weak and and um, unmasculine, they get sent off to a bloody school to sort it out. We used to do all that 100 years ago, you know, uh, but now um, we do the opposite. Anyway, so yes, the, the, it is um, causing the West to fall behind in many areas. Uh, our military, I mean, American military right now is going through this whole joke thing where generals are talking about critical race theory. The admiral is a cross-dresser um, and so on and so on and I won't go into too much detail but um, yes it's causing it's, it's having very serious repercussions it's not just some idle ideological standpoint. I find that almost a bit strange what you're saying about China there because the way I see it and maybe this is just shattering um, one of the theories that I have is that part of the reason why kind of masculinity has been so demonized in the West is, you know, very, very similar to why religion is demonized in kind of communist, um, communist nations, etc., which is normally because it poses some kind of threat to government power and that you have to kind of quash any kind of these alternative power structures. So I'm actually quite surprised that China 
would try to um, amplify masculinity in any way because I would have thought they'd go down the same route. Right. I, can, I need to qualify then my original statement. They are doing so, and there's no doubt about it. And for example, they've just brought out a film, a war film, which is like one of our old war films, where it's really patriotic and it really gets the blood stirring. And um, it's obviously the Chinese attack. I don't know, I haven't watched it, but uh, it's been commented on. Uh, what the secret to it is that they've re remasculinizing with a nationalist agenda. So they're making these men strong for China. China is going very nationalistic at the moment. Um, again, I think that's the natural default of all countries. It's very strange at the moment in England that we open our borders to just everybody, even though they're blowing themselves up in maternity wards on Remembrance Day or whatever it is. Um, very few other countries outside the West put up with anything like that. Uh, crikey, if you overstay your visa in Mexico for a few days, they'll have you locked up and, um, and you can be a, a rich Westerner. Um, yeah, we, we're doing at the other extreme in the West. So they, they're, they're, they're channeling this energy um, into a nationalist thing. Of course, what happens over time, if this continues, these trends, uh, guess what? Big, strong, masculine, nationalist China is going to have a lot of options re regarding the West. And I'm told, for example, Sweden's army, bearing in mind Sweden used to be a superpower in European history, uh, they can only fight for one week and they need about 10 weeks to prepare for that one week's fighting. So if anyone can last for eight days against the Swedes, Sweden will fall. It's as simple as that. And uh, this is just the stuff of fairy tales. It's unbelievable. It's bizarre. So obviously you're seeing a lot of this become more prevalent today. Um, but it seems like you've been on this journey longer than most have. It seems that the kind of, I guess... People would call it wokeism, but perhaps um, people like us would go a little bit deeper into this and, and see it as a quite a deliberate um, kind of propaganda attempt to disrupt um, power structures and to kind of assert um, dominance of the state over the individual, which seems to be the common theme of all of these things. So what was it you were seeing? Um, was it 14, 14 years ago you said that you started seeing seeing these things? I'm just interested to know what more. It, more. I took action 14 years ago and left the country. Uh, I called myself a preemptive political refugee at the time, and no one understood what I was talking about, but I just I, I saw myself as someone fleeing for political reasons my country, even though it wasn't obvious that there were good reasons to do so, but there, are, there were. And what were those early signs for you? Ah... Oh. So I'll tell you one was the bombing in London in 2000, early you know, July 7th or whatever it was, where they, uh, I, I was just in one of the streets nearby when they blew up all those trains and buses. And the reaction to it, um, there, there wasn't a reaction. And I had thought that this would be a, a, water, a high watermark in, in British politics and that we'd see a change in our policies towards open door pot, uh, immigration and all sorts. Um, that was certainly one. Um, probably, well, about, that's when I started looking at the Conservatives and I saw that the, they, were not, they were worse almost than the Labour Party. Therefore, there was no way out of this politically. Um, there were, must have been many dozens of other things. I think the way um, war veterans have been treated, uh, you can go on. There's a long list, but it, it was... Generally, everything was being done for the benefit of others and not for us. Uh, and, and anyone who stood up and said anything to the contrary was uh, like a lunatic, uh, exiled from society. Um, so, yeah, it was cumulative. There wasn't a dramatic moment, but there were certainly lots of mini dramas. It almost seems to me that recently there's kind of been a bit of an awakening of a silent majority. I'm not sure whether it necessarily is a majority, but it's certainly a large contingent of people who seem to now have found their voice and what used to be considered to be uh, impossible to do, like criticise wokeism and criticise some of these kind of neo-Marxist um, ideologies that are just so prevalent. Um, it seems to have become somewhat acceptable um, to actually do this. And people on the left would say, oh, well, you know, this is all the, you know, kind of right-wing extremists. But really, it seems that a lot of people are just kind of fed up of having things forced down their throat um, in terms of these 
um, ideas that we're either not allowed to discuss or ideas that are actually antithetical to kind of traditional um, liberalist Western values. And I use the word <laughs> liberalist quite deliberately because these people would call themselves liberals. But, um, you know, one of the things, for instance, that I find very odd is, you know, that people will will criticise um, things like systemic racism in the UK, which I don't deem to be, um, you know, certainly it might occur on very, very small levels, but I don't think that we have a systemic racism problem in, in the UK by any means. I think we're probably the most tolerant country in the world. I've been to a lot of places of and I don't, even even other Western countries uh, like, uh, you know, Australia and things like, I, I genuinely think that we are probably the most tolerant country in the whole world. Whereas these same people um, spend no time criticizing things like the fact that, um, you know, women are subjugated in, uh, you know, many, many like Muslim countries or, you know, other cultures which generally are not white cultures they seem to be kind of beyond um yeah criticism there's a caste system in india that no one mentions ever and yet we you know it's just an 800 or a billion of those and no one seems to even care no there's a terrible um bias uh, two-facedness about this um and it's these, it was the hypocrisy who kept screaming at me, the, the fact that, the, that these double standards for one lot and not for the other. Um, sooner or later, the, it's like snowflakes. They, they build up to the point where they can collapse any building. And um, there were many snowflakes falling at the time. Right. And I, and I definitely feel that now um, there has been the the straw that broke the camel's back is um coronavirus and the amount of hysteria around this issue um so it's probably good to get onto that subject because you know that's how we've connected and how i've connected with a lot of people recently is through that issue so i guess let's go back to the beginning um of your journey there where did you start realizing that there was something not quite right with the narrative on coronavirus I wasn't paying it much attention, but when I did hear these headlines I, and I heard that all the masks had sold out in my local town, I went and bought some. And that was the full extent of my complicity towards it. I bought three masks for the family. <laughs> Very, it was within days of that that I started um, doubting. Uh, I'll tell you the, the, the key. That's, everything's been brushed under the carpet, obviously. Um, but the key was that ship that went into Japan and was in quarantine for like 40 days. It was full of overweight ancient people because cruise ships are and the mortality rate was feeble com compared to a supposed pandemic um you know nearly everyone survived they were in an enclosed enclosed system i mean you couldn't make it more perfect they were sharing facilities they were in an enclosed uh, system air conditioning wise so they were all recycling the same air that's the nature of it being in a ship um you know, they were there for a month and the, the death rate was paltry and I started asking questions at that point. I will say that the, the theme of my novel it really is the sort of, uh, find the right word, how, how society has become basically quite pathetic over the decades. Um, we, we're like over pampered pets. And in fact, in one of the drafts of the novel, I was... There is a deadly bioweapon involved. I did toy with the idea of having a fake pandemic along these lines because you, I, I understood that society was ripe for it, that you could um, sort of fool everybody into committing mass harakiri if you wanted. That's how desperate the situation had become. The only reason I didn't use that story is I didn't believe anyone would believe it. You know, it would be at the moment they pick the book up and threw it across the room because they'd say, Oh, God, that's stupid. Uh, you know, I was hoping for some rabies, weaponized rabies or something, and you're going to tell me they're all going to collapse society over a few colds. <laughs> but there you are. So now I've actually rewritten the ending um, along those lines um, and uh, accommodated it. But, yes, uh, it, it was very clear to me from very early on, and unfortunately I also learned very early on, it doesn't matter what you do to try and stop those that, want to go along with it, you cannot. They are, they're it's too late for them. It really is 20 or 30 years too late, sadly. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I find interesting about everything that's happened recently is that 
before this period, we've kind of gone through um, probably several decades of training people to think um, in terms of feeling good, you know, regardless of any kind of actual assessment on whether your actions are having a net positive result. It's, you know, the concept of do this to feel good, do this for the greater good. This seems to have kind of gone on for, for quite a long time. And it, it appears to me as though, you know, in particular, we've never been able to, for instance, discuss economic impacts of things, um, you know, unless it's the economic impact of the government spending less money, for instance. We're allowed to talk all day about, OK, well, the government um, needs more money to do this. And if we if we have less money, if we lower taxes, for instance, then there'll be less money to feed school children, etc. Yeah. However, if you talk about the economic impact of a lockdown, for instance, you're considered to be not caring about lives. And I just find that so interesting that the only angle by which we're allowed to talk about economic impacts is from the angle of if we have less money for government. But if we say, well, people are going to have less money because you close all of their businesses down, um, then, you know, that's considered to be hateful and that you don't care about lives. We, it's, it's awful to say it and it's sad to say it and it, it, it's painful. Um, we have been under a power structure, I believe, for about 100 years, more or less, that has infiltrated every aspect of our lives, taken it over, and in the process it's completely um, disenfranchised us, whether it's our vote or our muscle power or our buying spending power or our sovereignty or anything. Um, we can't even do things that our ancestors took utterly for granted, like I believe co collecting rainwater is punishable in some places or drawing water from a, or having milk from a cow is, un, you know, is a, illegal because it's not been treated. Um, and it's a very bitter pill to swallow. And it's a very di difficult, difficult pill to swallow. So that's why we're in this, there's so much cognitive dissonance and people can't understand or won't ever even listen to you when you try and explain that something like as basic as pharmaceutical companies might not be in it for your health. It might be ulterior motives. However, I would also say that this same psychological operation is not just a top-down one. It's worked hard at creating a, a, a class of people towards the bottom who are complicit, because after all, elites are by definition elite and small and limited in their ability to... Um, exercise power they they have an immense power but if you can't if you're charging a, a, the enemy on your own in, in few numbers you're going to be wiped out and i think the great untold story of, of this uh, whole thing is that um there is a mass movement from below as well to assist in, in coordination almost well very much in coordination with the elites and these people are great in number um and that, that, that's the central theme of my book, because I do think it needs, that's one area that no one's understood, which is why there are still so many people. I mean, I don't believe the poll yesterday, but it said that something like 60 percent of Brits want a, a harsh lockdown again. Uh, uh, I think the poll is fixed, but that I do know that there's 20, 30, 40 percent of people um, on a sliding scale want some sort of lockdown again. And not all of those are naive innocents. This is very important. And it's the only only in recognizing this that we're ever going to solve the problem. A lot of these people are actively complicit. They benefit from it in ways that we might not understand ourselves, some financially and some through uh, exercise of power and so on. But they also enjoy watching us suffer and become bankrupted and, and so on. And that, I think, is an area that we need to start uh, focusing on quite a lot. There is a political term that's arisen in the last few years. It's called bio-Leninism. Um, um, an English guy called Spandrel, who lives in, oh, yes, that's the name. He lives in China, I think, or somewhere. He brought it up a few years ago, and it's, it's quite a big following. And it explains the mechanism, the physical mechanisms by which the elites work in, in conjunction with the, the downtrodden, shall we call them, for, the, for, the, for want of a better word. They're not often downtrodden. They're often very wealthy and powerful. But, but the, the people... Uh, amongst whom we we uh, socialize and live well worth a look by leninism yeah i totally agree with that point and it definitely does seem that there is this kind of um union between these groups who uh, feed off of each other 
And I guess it seems to me that very obvious, like to me, it's, it's an incredibly obvious thing that governments um, want to be wanted. Governments, you know, derive their power from the people. And of course, governments are going to do things um, to ensure that you're more dependent up upon them. And people who are who like to be dependent on others and who don't want to do things and who don't want to work, etc., they're being incredibly empowered right now. And unfortunately, there is quite a large group of them. There are quite a lot of people in society who don't want to work, who don't want to contribute. And for them, they have been um, kind of made heroes through this entire uh, thing. It's like if you tell people they're a hero for staying at home and, you know, locking the doors and not doing anything and just ordering Uber Eats and, you know, playing computer games, there's a lot of people who are going to get on board with that. I mean, it's a shame to say, and I'm not sure whether that would have been the case, as you say, 100 years ago, but certainly today people are quite prepared um, to be on board with that and to support it. That's bioleninism in a nutshell. You might want to look into it. Um, they get... Uh rewarded in, in many ways, not just fiscal. Um, and it's not just that, but they're not even happy to sit in their house like you just described it. They'll be screaming at their neighbor too, and maybe pushing over the old man in the street because he, he came within six feet of them. They are, it's a, there's a vicious underside to this that we don't really talk about. Um, and it's not just the COVID. It, it, it can be in, in every aspect of life from um, watching your, your neighborhood go to hell um, because of crime, uh, so they vote to get rid of the police. You know, we see it very clearly now in America. Um, this sort of antifa mentality, BLM, they're celebrating heroes who are, are burning down businesses and stuff. You know, it's a, there's an active part to it too, not just a passive one. And um, it's never mentioned, <laughs> really. Just to jump on that point you were you were mentioning about people, you know, wanting to scream at their scream at their neighbours, etc. This also seems to be an interesting phenomenon whereby people who are disempowered have now been given the opportunity by the government to suddenly have a role and suddenly have, um, you know, a purpose. You know, maybe people who haven't ever had a purpose. Now the government said, hey, well, you're now a hero in this story. And if your neighbor, you know, goes outside without a mask or, or whatever it is, goes into a shop without a mask, yeah. you can now call the police. You can now step up to them and say, hey, no, uh, you shouldn't be doing this. Put your mask on, etc." It almost seems to be that it's given people an opportunity to kind of be a hero in their own story. Absolutely. Now, um, luckily, and something's happened that's changed everything, and it's the internet, and it's access to information. If we were going into this without the internet, I know that the enemy would be weaker because they wouldn't have access to, to the, proper, the, the sort of propaganda machine. They'd still do it through TV and radio and newspapers, but they wouldn't quite have that 24-hour-a-day um, machine at work. But it's been much more beneficial to us, the internet, than it has the enemy. It's, it's been definitely taken a chunk out of their armor. Uh, and it's enabled us not only to do what we're doing exactly right now, coordinate and uh, uh, exchange opinions and, and sort of define our agenda, but we can look at history so easily. I, in two seconds, I can go to the Cultural Revolution in China. I can go to the Stasi in East Germany. And we can see these patterns always re-emerge. Re you know, this isn't something new. They're just using a system, a, a uh, sort of methodology that's been tried and tested in other countries in other centuries, um, and they're recycling it with a bit of added tech um, uh, for the for the 21st century. That's all we're seeing. And medicine has been thrown in instead of um, well, they've they done it with medicine before, I believe, in the in, in the great Spanish flu thing. But uh, this now instead of armies and stuff, they're using medicine as the main vehicle for the destruction of the people themselves. But luckily, and, and this is that invaluable, and all I can say is the more people start reading up on things like the Spanish Civil War or, or any of these um, great cultural putches of the oh, French Revolution, for goodness sake, um, they're going to, Weimar Germany, they're going to learn an awful lot about where we are today. Right, and um, this kind of is all reminding me of this uh, kind of common um, idea at the moment of, kind of hard times creating weak men and weak uh, men creating hard times. And then I, I, I'm butchering it, but <laughs> there is... I always uh, butcher it too. Yeah, I'm yeah. a fanatical believer in it. There, again, I, I'm going to bore you a little bit. There's a, a scientific theory that like bioleninism bio explains the mechanism of power. RK selection theory. RK selection theory. Look it up. Fantastic. Um, 
it's to do with biology. Uh, any any be, um, animal basically that gets indulged will change its behavior. It's as simple as that. From amoebas onwards, apparently, they'll change their breeding patterns, their consumption, and it can destroy them. They've done experiments with rats, um, famously, where they, Calhoun was the guy. They put all the rats in a cage and gave them everything they wanted, and they all died within uh, weeks because they overindulged um, and, and lost, lost any kind of virility, any kind of wish to live. And we are like Calhoun's rats in that sense. Um, and we're in very much at the peak of the uh, good times makes weak men. And that's where we're at. And of course, the problem with that is the next stage is hard times. Uh, weak men create hard times. So we're about to enter, well, we're in, a, I think, entering a very hard time. But that's a fascinating area. And I completely um, congratulate you on it, on identifying it. Um, more people need to be familiar with this sort of thing. So I just want to end on, um, well, actually, before we end, um, just tell us about your latest book. Uh, is it already out? And uh, just give us um, a, a little brief kind of synopsis of that. Um, it got a publisher in the 2005. That fell through, sat on my desk in my drawer for 10 years at least. I, I t played with it occasionally, nothing serious. Um, and then about five years ago, I saw a, a company in London was asking if, for a new a startup company, um, Endeavor Books, they were called. And um, I got it out and I sort of reread it, but I didn't, it was half hearted and I sent it off and lo and behold, they were very, they took it. The only problem, which was fine, and I was delighted to finally at least have it, uh, a hard copy in my hands. The problem was that in the 10 years that I'd been toying with it, I'd made lots of uh, type. I hadn't treated it as a serious work. I'd, I'd, I'd played around badly with it. So although it was with them, I wasn't quite satisfied. Funnily enough, some woke bastard saw something I'd posted on, on Facebook once. I actually, actually, I hadn't posted it. I had a Facebook group that somebody had posted something on this Facebook group that he didn't agree with. He's an Englishman in Mexico. And he went berserk. Within hours, he had been in touch with my publisher and my book had been deleted from their lists because of this inferred uh, non-PC comment somewhere at some point someone had made. It was all ridiculous, but the publisher was quite open. They, they're terrified of being um, you know, a witch hunt and that it would affect their whole business plan. So I was binned. It was a great thing. It, this woke twit did me a great favor because... I was able to rework the book and I've published it now on Amazon. It's a much better work. And um, I hope some of you will, yeah, listeners will, uh, will buy it and have a go. And what's it called? It's called Lost Causes. Sorry. Um, it deals with all the issues we've toyed with today. Um, it's written from a, an Anglo-centric position, but it applies throughout the West, the, the, the morals and the message. Um, it's a fast interesting read hopefully exciting read it's got girls and explosions and stuff um and the idea is that it, it will be a pleasure because this is our big stumbling block is that it takes a quite a bit of time and dedication to to understand what's going on and most people haven't got the time or the dedication to to read up articles and go to source material so my book hopefully is a, a fun way to absorb all all that you need to get going in the sort of counter attack that one day will hopefully manage to launch yeah and i definitely think that that's an important thing as well because there's so many people who are writing things at the moment it's you know i mean even twitter essentially is kind of just like a a collective diary of so many different people and you've got people writing various articles but it tends to be from a point of view of um certainly from from a non-fiction angle uh, I don't think there's too many people sure. doing that from from the fictional perspective. So um, I'd be really interested to see that. I, I look forward to reading the book soon. That'd be great. And I will say that anyone listening, get out there. There's a massive, massive hole in the market um, for non-PC, non-woke, uh, whether it's fiction, art, music, any of these things. There's a, you know, they've, it's been forbidden territory for 20, 30 years virtually. And there's a huge, huge demand for it. So anyone listening who's got the inkling, um, get on and, and do it. And uh, good luck to you. 
Okay, great. So thanks so much for this conversation. Uh, I really hope that we're going to get the chance to meet um, when I come back to Mexico, which hopefully I will be able to do despite the fact that Europe is descending by the day into authoritarian authoritarianism, which I expected before I came back here. But I'm trying to kind of live my life as normally as possible and to, um, you know, not live in fear every day. Uh, but obviously things are constantly changing, but hopefully that will happen. Just before um, we end though, would you mind um, just giving us a little bit of positivity? I like to end on a positive note. So, okay. you know, how, how do we win this? How do we get out of the situation that we're in? And what are the forces that are gonna work in our, fi- in our favor? Well, the biggest force in our favor is nature, human nature, the natural world. Um, People do ultimately have a will to survive, um, most people, not all now, but um, that will come through. It always does. It might take a while. and In really bad cases, it's taken 70 years, like in the USSR. But I, don't, I think with the internet and, and already we're seeing a backlash, um, I, I, I am 100% confident we're going to win it with the qualification that some places will go, you know, not everywhere will, will win it. Um, uh, I, big, my biggest fear is, is Europe. I think the EU is kind of the prototype for what they want, the, me- the mechanism, and they're very well established and very powerful. And the, the European people are effectively very weak. Um, I, do th- I do think that many parts of Europe will escape and, and be fine eventually. Um, but even the wa- uh, but many won't. But even the ones that are fine don't take this message as one of complete uh, relax and um, be very uh, um, relaxed about the whole thing. This is going to be a a struggle, the likes of which we haven't seen uh, since the Second World War. It might be worse. It might be much worse. Um, but like the Second World War, I, foresee, I think the enemy is already lost. I don't think that they can win um, long term. But in that in that long term there's going to be a lot of uh, heartache and grief and destruction i believe so long term fine if you're we're all going to have to put our wheel to the, uh, our shoulder to this wheel at some point whether we like it or not um and then if you want the one option that you've got is of course to move out and um go back as and when you feel it's right uh, but whatever you do we're all going to be involved there's no escape I completely agree with that. Thanks again so much for this conversation. Welcome. Very very welcome. Enjoyed it. Thank you.